about this for hours. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit about me. I come from a different place than most people here, but I come from a business that actually feeds families and makes a living from what we produce. Um, so, my name is Keith Ancho, if you don't know. Uh, I'm a master craftsman. I've been making leather goods since I was 16. I'm pretty uneducated, um, but I know how to make things. Um, so, I made that 15 years ago. That's the looks good. Um, I'm the managing director currently of the Red Satchel Company, which is a family-owned business. Um, my uncle set up in 1966. I don't really want to be the managing director, but no one else is trying to put the hours in for the day. Um, I'd rather be making things with my hands, that's what I'm really enjoying. Um, I'm also a bit of a geek. I love tech, absolutely love tech. At the age of 12, I taught myself machine code. And I speak HTML, I speak five, six, six, PHP, um, JavaScript, MySQL, a few other languages. Um, I guess that kind of makes you a bit of a nerdy computer geek, but you know, I'm not cool with that. Um, I really think of myself though as, as a, a creative, as an artist who just never got a chance to go to an art college. You know. um, at the moment in our workshop, I'm trying to build a smart workshop. So I'm trying to implement tech into the workshop to give us more visibility and bigger data, but also more transparency to the consumer. So there's lots of things I can't really talk about in this scope, but there's a lot of things we're doing that are going to help market our people as well. Um, a bit about the business. The Leather Satchel Company was established in 1966 by my uncle, I told you. They were the oldest surviving satchel maker in England. In fact, from the 80s, right the way through until Harry Potter came along, we were the only satchel maker. Um, right now, uh, we're the only bespoke satchel maker, so uh, people can come to us and make me that. I've like two pockets, like a bigger, I have like a pocket in the back and backpack straps or whatever, and a white hat, purple leather with red trimming. You know, so that, that's what we do, that's what makes us unique. Um, the question I've been asked to answer basically is what happens? when large-scale manufacturing tries to imitate small makers or as small makers try to scale up. So I'm going to get, I was asked this question like months ago, so it's been in the melting pot of my mind for a long time. Um, got some thoughts on paper, which I'm going to try and give you my insight to that. It's my opinion, don't know whether it's right or wrong, you know, like I say, it's this how it is. So I've probably got very different opinions to a lot of people that pose the questions, so it might be interesting that one. Um, I want to start with an experiment. Um, so, can everyone put their hands up for me? Yeah. Um, keep your hands up if you've heard of a chap called Terry Pratchett. Say again. If you've heard of a chap called Terry Pratchett. Yeah. Keep your hands up if you've read one of the Discord novels. Keep your hands up if you've read The Colour of Magic. Keep your hands up if you can tell me The Colour of Magic. Oh, it's good. <laughs> Go on. It's like, it's like an octarine, it's somewhere a bit like octarine. Okay. Chapter three, octarine, well done, sir. So octarine um, is a colour that humans can't see. It's something we can't see, we can't <coughs> perceive it, we don't know what it is. Um, they say it's a shimmering purple mixed with neon green. Yeah? And only wizards and cats can see it because they have different nodes in the receptors of their eyes that allow them to see that. It's a pretty cool concept. I'll come back to that at the end. Um, so, the idea of a single craftsman making things and making a living out of it is just that. It's, it's just an idea. It doesn't exist anymore, really. As a professional global level, what you have is the goalposts have moved. So that idea we had set as a single craftsman, someone like me trying to make a living, making them, it's, it's impossible, I can't do that on my own. Um, because the goalposts have moved from what my family used to produce in the 60s to what we produce now, the standard is so much higher, so much more is expected of that. We're on a global playing field now, not a local playing field. So you look back at Louis Vuitton at Hermes backs, back in the 1920s and the quality now is far superior than it used to be that you look at them and you think it's a hobby craft. You know, good products for them, but not for now. 
And I think that idea, it's just nostalgia, it doesn't really exist. So things, things change. Um, I think this occurs primarily because a true craftsman not only masters his craft on how to make things, how to work with his hands, but he also learns how to master his tools. And the tools nowadays are very different to the tools in the past. So we've got things like 3D printers and laser cutters and all kinds of like dye sublimation, all kinds of things. So to be able to master your craft now, there's a whole bunch of new tech that you need to master. And it's impossible to have that tech and master that tech as a single person. There's just too much knowledge. The, the, the problem you have is a single craftsman to master them tools needs to own them tools. You can't just come into a maker space and play every now and then. You're never going to master a 3D printer exactly how it works by just playing with it occasionally. Same with a laser cutter, same with a human printer. It's never going to happen. You need your own tool. You need to know every single intricacy of it, how to get the best cut, all that kind of stuff. And then tools take space, they also take money. And you can't then produce and afford that space at the same time. And that's why the master craftsman now, because the standards of change doesn't exist as a single person. You have really good hobby crafters, which are fantastic, but there isn't a master out there that exists on their own. Firstly, there's too many roles in, in, in this globalised world for a single handed craftsperson to manage successfully. So the, the marketplace is just too demanding. It's not just about being able to make something, I think, and sell that product. And that's a whole new set of skills. So when you've got a business, you've got makers, a producer, that's your traditional cast person. You've then got the marketer, which nowadays is a digital team. So you need someone to look after your social, your marketing, your photography, your promotion, and their items. And then behind that, you need a third person to manage the business aspects, the administration, the logistics, the shipping, the export procedures, and everything else. So you're expecting the maker to master his tools, do it in a space, pay for that space, learn how to market, and also do all the expert and logistics. It just can't happen. It just can't happen. Um, so the reality of this, the meme of a single craftsman can, can only survive nowadays, but they've got to evolve with it. So that single craftsman supported by a team. Um, you know, the tale of a, a chocolatier in Switzerland, kind of hand tempering chocolate, pouring it into moulds and getting them out. And it doesn't exist. It's all a factory line. It doesn't exist because every single product is exactly the same. And all you're seeing is just this tale of what you'd like it to be from the 1920s. You know, it, it just doesn't exist like that anymore. Um, the reason is that for factories like that, there's no need for a human to be involved either. We don't want to do that work, it's mind numbing. It's just, it's the same thing going on over again, sitting there going, oh, I'm going to pull this in the air. Who wants to do that? It's, there's no artistry in that. You just, as soon as you split a process down into its component parts, the artistry is gone. And, and this, you know, this is the difference now, so it's about. It's about a balance between art and industry, which we always have this dichotomy whereby we want artists, but we also need to produce. And, and since the industrial revolution, production is the focus. It's not how you know. It's how much money can we make to produce this? How can we get this process cheaper? How can we make it faster? Not how can we make this more sustainable? How, how can we make this last 30, 50 years? You know, you're producing products now and in built redundancy, you know, it's like, yeah, it's not going to work in five years. So it's like, these aren't the questions that are being asked. So it's, it's very hard. And, and by doing that, what you're doing is you're taking <coughs> the art out of the process. But that's the enjoyable bit. So being able to make something and get a high lever and cut it and turn it into a bag. This, we were talking about this. Why do you feel so connected to the products? Why? Because you care about them, because part of you's gone into that. There's a connection there. And when you take that away, it becomes industrial. And there's, there's no love or passion in the product. People don't care. But, you know, when, you, when you're buying chocolates, or you're buying smartphones, or you're buying socks, it, it, you don't need to be individual and personal. You know, they're just things, the things we put on our feet, or the things we use every day. The software allows us to customise them to us. 
Traditional manufacturing with humans is all design products that are bespoke to unique individuals. You know? So, and how does that scale? So, quickly going to go into how you scale that up because unfortunately it's not very scalable. So, there are businesses that exist that try and look like small artisan businesses, they try and copy what we do. I've had big businesses come in and literally look at my social feeds for ideas. God, that's a really great buy. I'll take that and then they'll, they'll produce it. Produce 10,000 of them. I'm producing this one as well. We've had that, and that happens still now. So the big book, there's a bag that Doc Martens launched a couple of months, that's one of my bespoke designs. But I don't mind that, it used to hurt me a lot. And now I'm like, hey, it's quite flattering actually, you know? Because um, I've got 10 million other designs I can do, you know? Um, the, the challenge we have is that when you get big companies trying to copy what you do and then they don't understand what it is we're actually doing, so we're making this bug bags for individual people and they're producing, they're going, that's great, I'll produce that. So we have a Chinese factory emulating what we created, my product, my brand, everything. Obviously not to the standard, but producing them for China. Quite good in a way because I'm not in China, but I sell to Chinese people. It proves to me that there's a massive demand for my products out there if I can scale up. I can't. Um, but anyhow, so they copied a unique product off my social feed and reduced like hundreds and hundreds of it. The problem is they can't sell it because that product is made for one individual with very niche needs. You know, and they're wondering why is this product selling? Everyone's raving about this on social media. You know, and, and it, 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 big factories can emulate small makers, but they don't have our agility to deal with individual products. And that's where the small makers fit into the marketplace, is being able to go, well, what do you want making? I need this making. And that's where the makers can really take an advantage. And that's where we get the enjoyment out of it, because the heart goes into producing them items from start to finish. There's an artistry to learning how to use them tools. Um, companies still continue to do that now as well. Um, so, if it's consumable, in summary, we'll never beat mass manufacture. Um, mass manufacture and AI robots eventually will take over all production line, all the monotony. When you look at rows and rows of my long Chinese factories, they won't exist in the future. That will be done by a bot. It's the same thing over and over again. What I'll never be able to do is that bot, not in my lifetime, not in <laughs> to be able to listen to you and go, here's what you need. What you need is this, and I can make one of them just for you. You know, and that, in, in our lifetime, to have a bot doing that, it's never going to be able to happen. That's where the maker comes in. How do you scale that? I think the only way it can scale, so my team consists of me. So I'm lead creative and I do just about everything to do with the creative side of the business um, as, as a director as well. I have two lead product designers that work alongside me, so they help engineer systems so we can produce products. And then alongside them, we have about a dozen makers. And the makers make products as though, if they're able to, they make everything from start to finish. If they can't, then someone will step in and help out with that system and teach them so they learn it. So that creates a pride in the products and the quality of the product is always higher. Unfortunately, as you scale that up, things break, the quality falls down. So how do we solve that? And the answer is distributed manufacture. I don't know if any of you heard the term before, but fundamentally, you create small pods of manufacturing centers, like maker spaces. Trained up in the skills, in the same skills, the same spaces. It's that sure design ideas, that sure the same tools. Oh, I've got this laser cutter, we've got that laser cutter, you've got this, I've got that, I've got that press, I've got that sewing machine, all them little tricks and trade secrets are shared in this that space. So you get the quality of a global brand, but it's made locally by people you know. And it's, it, it's made using local materials. You know, so you're getting this global standard, this global sharing of ideas amongst the team who produce things. But, but it's, it's done in a, this local way and it's, it's ecologically sound. It's more ecologically sound than shipping stuff all over the world, and trying to make things and shipping it back to get packaged and shipping it here. And so that, that to me is the future of small scale making and manufacturing. 
you know, look at it, I, I, I see that really bright. It really is a bright future. It's not orange, you know, but it's all green. <laughs> it's kind of magical. It's this, you know, the benefit of big, big kind of brand awareness and social media. So it's like social media, you know, it's like you only need social media once. But when you've got this space, it's like you're saving on time, but you've got these parts like can all make local. But you've also got this relationship with the local people as well. And I think that's really, really important. Yeah. And that's that's my kind of insight as to what happens as a, as a maker scales up and what happens when big manufacturing tries to imitate or copy makers as well. <coughs>